Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Oaks and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. First, if you are experiencing audio issues, a call-in number is listed on the screen here. For some attendees, it tends to work better by dialing in with a phone versus a computer. Next, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. However, if you have any questions, please utilize the questions panel, typically located on the right. We will pause throughout the webinar to read and answer your questions. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you. You can also find it on the BankFirst website. Please allow me to introduce our presenter for today. Daryl Mandieri was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio, excuse me. He has been married to Cherie for 26 years and has three children. Daryl has been involved in nonprofit management for 17 years. He was an elementary and special education teacher, as well as worked in the amusement industry for over 10 years in Ohio and California. Daryl began his tenure with Family Service Association of Sheboygan in late December 2019 and quickly hit the ground running to be certified by the National Foundation for Credit Counseling as a financial educator and budget and credit and housing counselor. He assumed the mantle of leadership as executive director on July 1st, 2020. Daryl is a member of the Early Bird Rotary, serves on the Partners for Community Development Board, as well as numerous community committees. Let's get started. Daryl, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Rachel. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you to uh, Bank First for making this webinar possible. And we're so excited uh, to be able to uh, partner with them. And they are truly a uh, community and civic minded and hence the reason they're making this this webinar available to you as rachel said i was a, a school teacher and I, I think i've never stopped teaching and assuming this role as executive director i still find myself in the teaching role uh, whether it's in the community or doing individual counseling or doing presentations uh, a couple of ground rules for all of us as we get started i don't want you to feel that this is a lecture of me uh, presenting information and a deluge of information, but I want you to feel comfortable to ask questions and stop me at any time. I don't uh, proclaim to be a guru of everything uh, financially related, but if you have a question and I don't have an answer for you, I will do my best to dig deep and research and get you that information, whether over the phone or through an email. Uh, feel free to contact me here at the office as well at any time for any questions or as you contemplate things. So as we build a rapport, we want this to be uh, very informal in a sense that you can sit back, uh, you can enjoy something to drink or eat. I can't see you do, see you do that, so make yourself comfortable. And um, masks are optional, so that's, that's an important thing uh, to remember as well. I want to let you know um, just the mission of our organization. Our organization has been in existence since about 1912. And although the name and some of our initiatives have changed over time, uh, we've really stayed true to our mission of having our fingers on the pulse of what the community needs. And overall, our mission is to help individuals and families achieve financial stability and to improve their quality of life. And that looks different uh, for many, many individuals that, that we work with, but we do try to come alongside people uh, to walk with them in their shoes, and we like to be instillers of hope and present options that work out well for them as well as, as for their families. Um, we are fully accredited through the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, COA, which is the Council of Accreditation. Uh, we're funded by the United Way, uh, banks and institutions, private foundations, uh, the general public, and we are a HUD-approved uh, counseling agency. We go through stringent uh, recertification and testing on a regular basis, and through the onset of COVID, we've been learning about all the different ways we can help people that have struggled uh, through this pandemic because there are a lot of nuances uh, to assisting people and different programs and things that are available. So at any time, if you want to give us a call, our, our number is very simple. It's 800-350-CCCS, and that will connect you to um, our office here in Sheboygan. I thought we would just start off with a couple introductory statements, and I want you to mull over these um, if you don't mind. It kind of sets the stage of what we're talking about uh, today. First of all, um, the first introductory statement is managing your debt seems like an oxymoron. So 
is it possible to manage your debt? The, the two don't seem to go together. Is having debt a good thing? And why would someone want to manage uh, that debt? I think we've all been taught, and I was taught from an early age, I'm well into my 50s, to pay for everything in cash. And that does not always apply. Um, credit and debt can be used in a good fashion. So we'll talk about that as well as we talk about good debt versus bad debt, but more of that uh, a little later on. So secondly, um, managing your debt requires discipline. It requires strategy, and it really requires a knowledge of your budget as well as your, your spending patterns and habits. And a lot of times when I'm talking to people, when they hear the word budget, they kind of cringe. And uh, so if you want, you can supplant that word budget. You could also call it a spending plan. It's a, a little more palatable. It rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. It, it takes away that tenseness that we feel when we heard that word. We hear that word budget. So keep that in mind as well. And something else I'd like to mention, another introductory statement is, you can live debt free. And is that fact or fiction? A lot of people do uh, live debt free. They still have that credit card for emergencies. And we always recommend never, never close an account because that does affect your credit rating. We'll put that credit card in a safe place to use for emergencies. Some people we have even cut those cards up and we have thousands of credit cards in these glass jars to, to represent that when we're counseling. So you can live debt free. I will underscore the fact that living debt free doesn't happen overnight. And I also want to tell you to waylay any myths about that, that living debt free does not require you to live in a commune, to grow your own produce, uh, to live off the land, to be a minimalist, and uh, really to live secluded or live in a silo. You don't have to do that. It's, living debt free is a process, it takes time. Uh, some of us, such as myself, took a little longer than I anticipated. I still have a mortgage, still working on that. I'm on the 29-year plan for that and hopefully can pay it off sooner. But it does take, take a plan. And most importantly, um, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed or feel discouraged because really, um, if you have a plan and pattern in place, it does take time and anything worthwhile takes time. So any small step that you take is a step in, in the right direction and it's moving forward. And that's that's really the point that I want to underscore here today, that it's never too late to make a difference in your financial health and, and plan for the future. And we counsel people that are newlyweds, individuals that are, are in the process of owning their first home. Uh, we counsel individuals in their pre-retirement years as they're planning for retirement and want to put a solid spending plan and budget together. And we also work with individuals who also are going through the throes of an eviction, foreclosure, and have to consider bankruptcy as the last result. We're not here to cast judgment on anyone. We're here to and still hope, present options, and walk with them through the process and be that listening ear and build a solid rapport. So. Um, you'll find that about our agency, we're very non-judgmental. We just want to help. That's our mission, to help people achieve that financial stability. So at this time, I want to jump into one of our first slides. And talk about today's agenda. We're going to be talking about uh, good debt versus bad debt. We're going to talk about eight steps to get out of debt faster. We're going to talk about one of my personal favorites and one I'm constantly working on myself is the top 10 budget killers. We're going to talk about debt management plan and I'm also going to share some resources with you. And even though I'm the executive director of this organization, can I share with you from my heart that I was a, I was a client first. I came to them when I was in between jobs and said, you know, I got to get my budget in order. I'm not making as much money as I used to. My income, income has been decreased. I really want to see how this looks on paper. And uh, it was so nice to have a printed copy of my budget and where I currently was. And after working with the council, where I could be after making some, some small, minute uh, changes. And it, it just did a world of good for both my wife and I to see everything on paper. 
So we're going to start by talking uh, about good debt versus bad debt. And please feel free, um, you could put a, um, a question or a comment in the chat. And Rachel and Emily are here to monitor those and, and to stop me and say, hey, we got something in the, in, in the chat room. I'll be happy to stop and answer that. But want to make sure that we're pausing uh, throughout our webinar today to hear from you. And that's, that's so important that we hear from you and, and are able to an answer those specific questions that you have. Just waiting for our slide to advance here. When technology works, it really works, but when it doesn't work, okay, here we go. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Can we even classify debt as being good debt and bad debt? The way that I was raised, I was raised by two grandparents. Um, they were born in the de Depression era. They saved everything, uh, sometimes to their chagrin. <laughs> they saved uh, too much even canned goods and things like that. But there are real sticklers when it comes to saving. And my grandfather paid everything with cash. Um, he established credit uh, later on, but um, that was the mentality, the way that I was raised. Maybe you were too. So we didn't even talk about that as being good or bad. But, you know, as I've discovered over the course of time, you've probably discovered too, that debt can be used responsibly and used it in a good way. And there is good debt. So when you think about good debt, what, what comes to mind? Kind of a rhetorical question. And there's a simple rule about good debt and about debt in general, that if it increases your net worth or has future value or adds value to your life, it's good debt. But if it doesn't do that for you and you don't have to pay cash for it, uh, we would we would classify that as as bad debt. And when we think about good debt, if you own a home, having a mortgage is good debt. Um, owning property, owning real estate is always normally considered always a good investment. We know that the market goes up and down. And if you're selling your home right now, <coughs> excuse me, or contemplating that, um, it is a seller's market where homes are getting uh, way more than the asking price. And is that going to change? Uh, in the Sheboygan area where I'm located, um, they said that's probably going to remain consistent for a while and that current home prices uh, really reflect what they, they should be. Whether you agree with that or not, those are some of the things I'm hearing uh, in the marketplace. Also good that uh, buying things that save time and money. So if you do your own taxes, and you're using a tax program and you've invested in that, that would be considered good debt because there's going to be a return on your investment. It's going to pay off in the long run. It's going to be a benefit to you and your family. And also investing and borrowing for education uh, is always important. We know that we live in a student loan crisis and that number keeps changing in the billions and billions of dollars of what people Ooh, but if it's going to better things for you and your family to have education, and it doesn't have to be a four-year degree. It could be continuing education at LTC or another uh, two-year institution, two-year institution, or going for some type of uh, credentialing program for a certificate that betters you. That's considered to be good debt. But if we flip the coin and look at bad debt, those are things that would cause you to lose value at the moment of ownership. So think about it. And I just purchased a, a used car not too long ago, and it's amazing um, how used cars, um, they've, they've really escalated in price, that there's a shortage of used cars, that in some cases, um, there are car dealerships that will buy back your car from you um, even more than what you originally purchased it for. So um, that's what's happening in our market due to the shortage of, of cars and, and new cars that are, are still on the line if they're missing uh, uh, the chip or there's a, there's a supply issue. Um, that's what's happening in our marketplace right now. But a car loan is considered a bad debt. We know as soon as you drive it off the lot, there's depreciation. Uh, so that would be considered bad debt. Credit cards, obviously a bad debt because if you're just going to pay back the minimum monthly payment, and I've been there, uh, not casting any judgment, 
but it just adds years onto that. But not only does it take a long time to pay back those credit cards, but the interest that you've paid can sometimes be exorbitant over the course of 10, 12, 15, 20 years, uh, depending on the, the amount of money that you owe. And clothes as well, um, you buy them, um, it, it, it turned out to be a bad investment. So I'm a real proponent and I have two daughters and a son and I always tell them, let's go to the local thrift store first. Um, no matter if it's Goodwill, the Salvation Army, let's see if we can find it there. And it's amazing the amount of money um, that you can save if you can find things in your size. But you can also go online and find things at a bargain or a discount. My wife will often go to Aeropostale or um, one of the other uh, companies that sells jeans. I have very long legs there. They're hard to find in that 36 inseam. And she normally can find a deal on those. So that's what my second go to is always um, to try to get things uh, online or use Kohl's cash and never pay the, the full retail price. So there are ways to, to save money. But let me pause for a moment and see if anyone has any thoughts about good debt or bad debt, any questions or any comments, or um, I would love to be able to learn from you as well. As you know, learning is reciprocal. Hopefully I'm imparting some knowledge to you, but I am eager uh, to learn from you as well. So I'll, I'll pause and see if there are any questions in the chat room that you'd like to ask. No questions yet, Daryl. Okay. We'll, we'll go ahead and forge ahead. And, and once again, anytime you have questions, please put those in the chat room and I'll be happy to stop and answer those to the best of my ability. Rachel, would you be able to advance the slide? For some reason, I lost that function. Okay, there we go. I might even move up one, two to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. Well, one thing we like to, to talk about, there's always these mathematical rules, and I don't know about you, but um, through high school and, and college, I often struggled sometimes with math, especially if it wasn't applicable. I'd often ask an algebra teacher, well, how does it apply uh, to life, but what does it matter what X is? But the more I delved into it, there's a lot of things that are applicable with problem solving and percentages. And my world right now deals with budgets and percentages and uh, rates of inflation and how does it affect the work we do as an agency and what's our, our bottom line? So these things have really become very near and dear uh, to me, but this is a rule of thumb. It's not applicable. Uh, in every situation, but uh, generally it, it does prove to be true. And there's an industry rule of thumb that talks about 28% um, that you should really no more than 28% of your pre-tax household income or your gross income to go to servicing home debt. And that would be principal and interest, taxes and insurance. And sometimes we say uh, P&I plus the escrow. So the principal interest plus the escrow, taxes and insurance, um, that's a wonderful way to, to roll all that into one payment. You don't have to set aside any money for taxes and insurance. You're paying that same monthly amount and maybe even putting a little additional um, on the principal to pay off that loan quicker, your mortgage loan. And then 36%, the other half of that equation, is that no more than 36% of your, your pre-tax income, your gross income, to go to all debt. Well, that would include your home debt, um, plus your credit card debt and your auto loan. So that pipe chart provided there by the Charles Schwab uh, company is a nice guide um, that you can follow and just have that mental picture of that 28 to 36 uh, rule. We're going to talk about um, the eight steps to getting out of debt faster. And maybe some of you um, have some of your own steps that you've used to, to get out of debt faster. I like to incorporate um, a lot of what the, the gurus in the financial world agree on. And sometimes they don't agree. And I so much don't follow that. I look for um, points of agreement. So whether you uh, uh, like Charles Schwab company or whether you like to follow uh, Dave Ramsey and some of his techniques like the snowball, snowball method, 
or the avalanche technique. I think there's something, little bits and pieces we can pull out of um, people that are uh, considered to be industries in the world of uh, finances and consolidating debt and how to get out of debt faster. What are the, the points of agreement that we can apply some of those? And this, these next steps, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on some of those, but first and foremost, um, what we've discovered, people say, well, how do I get out of debt faster? Well, first of all, getting out of debt will not occur overnight. There's a strategy that has to be involved, sort of as if you're investing money. And um, you might want to look at, if you're investing money in stocks, you know, what's something applicable? I know that at the height of, you know, when pandemic first started, people were investing in sanitizer and, and companies that made um, sanitary wipes and masks and things like that. And who could have predicted um, the trend um, in the investment and financial world? But uh, they're always looking for new things that are on the horizon. But first of all, you want to stop creating new debt. If you really want to get out of debt, it doesn't make any sense uh, logically to open up new credit cards and to amass more debt. It's only gonna snowball and get bigger. And you've probably heard about throwing that proverbial rocket to the water, the ripple effect. Well, that ripple tends to grow and grow and grow before it dissipates and fades away. So stop creating uh, new debt, first and foremost. Secondly, you wanna do a financial checkup and you wanna do some introspection. And it's important to, to do that. And, to imagine, if you will, close your eyes for a moment, and I'm closing my eyes as well along with you. What would it look like uh, to be debt free? And there's a couple of questions that you can ask yourself throughout the process. Where am I? Where am I now? It's important to visualize where you are now, and then to think about where you want to be in the future. And when we're working with people with their budgets. Those are some of the questions we ask them. We work with them and we don't just create a budget for them, <coughs> excuse me, or give them an action plan, say, hey, do this, this, and this, follow X, Y, and Z, and you can arrive at, at this magical uh, place. We work with them to find out what options work best for them and their family. We create the budget with them and we create the action plan with them and empower them. And um, that's one nice thing about our agency, we empower, uh, we're non-judgmental. We want to work with you and, and through this process and celebrate with you as well. So you're asking yourself, where am, where am I now? And that on a budget or spending plan, that would be your current financial position, uh, your income, any debt and all your expenses. And then we look at, do you have a zero balance budget? Do you have a surplus budget? Do you have extra money to work with? Or do you have a budget that's in a deficit? And don't beat yourself up if your budget is in a deficit. There's things we can talk about when we get to our section on budget killers to maybe free up some money so maybe you can have a surplus or get closer to that zero balance budget. So we look at that side of the budget, but then where do you want to be after you've explored some options and you have two different sides of the budget to look at? And those are all goals and things to, to shoot for. So those are the two introspective questions. And then number two is you want to get an attitude. And I've got some teenage daughters, and that's another type of, of attitude we're not going to delve into. I'd rather not talk about that. I'm having some free time away from that. But you want to change your, your habits um, and your attitudes as it comes to uh, spending. How are you spending your money? Where is it going? And as we'll talk about later, can you identify some budget monsters or some things that are eating away? at any extra income that you could have. And I'm not gonna beat you up to say, uh, don't go uh, don't go out to a restaurant once in a while. And if you're a smoker, I'm not gonna beat you up on that. Or if you like to have uh, some libations from time to time and have a, a beer or what have you, I'm not here to beat you up on that. Um, but we could talk about ways that, that you can save and potentially uh, free up some of that income that you've worked so hard uh, to amass. And then you wanna spend wisely. Um, there's different uh, things that we can talk about. Some people use an envelope system and they put money away and um, it's very time consuming, but it does work for some people. And if you could leave with one thing today, know that the things we're touching on are just really the tip of the iceberg, that if you want to dig deeper, give us a call. We'd be willing to 
to do a session with you either over the phone, virtually, or in person. We can help you work through some of these issues and and um, move forward with your, your goal of, of either living debt free or reducing some of your debt. And then you want to protect what you have. Um, if you have a home, that's probably one of your, your greatest investments. If you own a car, we talked about that being bad debt. But you want to be able to um, preserve that car over the, the term of your loan if you owe on it or if you don't. What can you do to have some safeguards to maintain that vehicle so you don't have to go out and purchase another vehicle and maybe have another uh, type of car loan? And different ways that you can save even small amounts of money um, for car maintenance. So we talked about um, number one, stop. Of creating new debt, um, do your financial checkup, that introspection, that visualization that only you can do. I can't do that for you. Um, get an attitude. And with that said, I'm going to pause for a moment and see if there are any questions or maybe one of uh, one of our participants today can share with us and for the good of the whole, maybe something that's worked for them. And I've, I've got my, my pen and paper at the ready because I'm, I'm all ears and want to learn from you as well. So I'll pause for just a moment and also uh, wet my whistle, so to speak. No questions or comments at the moment, Daryl. Okay, thank you. I don't know about you, but um, towards 5.30 or 6 o'clock, and my mind is thinking about what's, what's for dinner, so I understand, and uh, we'll just move on to point four then. Um, do a debt analysis and consider your options. Um, you can work with your local bank, and, and uh, Bank First is an excellent example of, of a local bank that's there to support you and help you. You can talk about a, a consolidation loan, consolidating all that debt into one loan uh, to make it more manageable. I don't know about you, but um, if you're paying multiple creditors, sometimes it gets very overwhelming, either writing that check or going to an online banking format and sending that money. Um, to be able to do just one click, so to speak, or one check, um, that would free up time. You could spend more time with your family and doing other things too, especially as, as the weather is changing and to enjoy the, the beautiful uh, fall foliage and the leaves changing and, and all the wonderful things that surround uh, this beautiful fall season. Um, you can also talk to your local uh, banker about balance transfers, home equity lines, uh, cash out loans, consolidation loans, all those different things to get you one step closer uh, to living debt free or to shrinking that debt. Um, so those are very important things. If you've not developed a relationship uh, with your bank, I'd encourage you uh, to do that. We know we live in a in an online world today uh, where everything is one click of a button away, and a lot of banks do have that where you can meet with them virtually. But I'd encourage you to build that relationship with your banker, let them get to know you and, and to build that rapport and they will look out uh, for your best interests in the same manner that we would during a, a counseling session as we build that relationship with you. So there's just three pointers on doing a debt analysis and considering uh, your option. We're gonna advance to the next slide. Developing a plan for paying off your debt. You may be familiar with this acronym. They call it SMART, SMART Goal Setting. So the S standing for specific, the M for measurable, the A for attainable, the R for realistic, and the T uh, for timely. As we work with our counselees and those coming in for assistance, we do develop uh, an action plan that has goals, goals that the individual identifies that are specific and measurable and applicable to them as an individual or to their family that are attainable. There's nothing worse than setting a goal for yourself that you're not going to be able to attain. If you think about individuals, especially during the time of New Year's resolutions, and I'm guilty of this myself, I would say, okay, I want to get in better shape at the New Year. And I start off real strong with a, a regimen of calisthenics. And then life um, starts to suck me in and I get more involved at work or extracurriculars with my family. And although I've got good intentions, I'll just fall by the wayside. So I've been working lately on more realistic goals of 
what I can do. So my daughter is a runner. Unfortunately, my knees aren't what they used to. So now I'll follow behind with her on the bike. And I'm able to kill two birds with one stone. I'm able to spend that that time with my daughter to to have meaningful conversation and uh, good quality time, but also getting some exercise in as well. I live very close to our office, three to four blocks away. I can walk to work and maybe pick up the pace a little bit. Um, I can walk my dog, and now my daughter has a dog, which uh, for all intents and purposes, I think is my adopted dog. I can walk the dog. I can build those things into place to get some exercise. You want to make sure that your goals are realistic. Can you achieve it in the time that you've specified? And when you're goal setting, if you're not having opportunity to celebrate your achievements, it can become a real downer, a real bummer. So set realistic goals for yourself. And I'm not saying your goal has to be to pay off your debt in one year. That may not be feasible for you. It may be feasible or possible for someone else. It might take you three to five years. But if you have a plan in place, and you're constantly honing it and refining it and measuring it, that's very important to measure it. Is it working? You can tweak your goals at any time. It's your goal. They're very unique uh, to you and to your, your personality and, and to your, your particular stage of life you're in. And also that it's timely. Um, can you achieve that goal in that, that fashion? So that's um, smart goal setting, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. Number eight talks about developing, developing a savings habit. I don't know about you, but so many times um, we can feel beat up when it comes by this because uh, when it comes to savings, because we think we have to save hundreds and hundreds of dollars from our paycheck each month. For some of us, that may not be possible. It may be possible for you to only put five dollars away a month or 25 dollars but that's a step in the right direction those are moments uh, to celebrate a lot of times when we're counseling individuals they say well i can only afford to do ten dollars a month we say yes we celebrate that with them because that money will grow over time especially when you're talking about emergency savings and um Kent will tell you and one of the things they like us to, to counsel on is if you're able to put 25 to $50 a month in a special account that you would call emergency savings and not touch it unless an emergency develops. I mean, emergency is different for each of us. And I think with the pandemic, with COVID-19, our eyes have really been opened to potential emergencies that can happen. But let's suppose um, that your car breaks down. You can either tap into an emergency savings account if you have it, or have to put that on a credit card. Now, some people may not have enough in their emergency savings, but they have some that they can apply to it. That's that's good too. I'd applaud that because that means they're charging less. Maybe they're only going to charge half of that. We know that we depend on our cars for transportation. So sometimes they do a 50-50 split. They they take the emergency savings, they apply it towards the car repair, and they pay for the rest on their credit card. That's a lot better than putting 100% on a credit card. And then investing wisely. Um, if you're in a position to be able to invest, understanding the risk versus what the return is. As I'm getting older, I have a 403B. I have some input into ways that uh, my funds manager would invest those amounts. I'm well into my 50s. I'm not going to take the same amount of risk that I would take, uh, for instance, when I was in my 20s and a, a school teacher fresh out of college and working with the uh, um, my 401k manager, you know, I take more risks at the time. Um, you want to develop a strategy and it's important to have a strategy and to, to write down and be able to articulate that. And if you're married, um, I will tell you it's important that you and your, your partner are involved in this, this strategy together. And I know from personal experience of, of being a minister in the past that when you went and mentioned the word money and budgets, um, it seems like, you know, the gloves come out, but um, you can have fun in that and celebrate with your spouse or significant other when um, you're able to save or when you follow a strategy. I encourage you to celebrate those successes along the road, no matter how big or, or small they are. Celebrate together and treat yourself from time to time too. That's very important. And seek professional help. I know it's very hard to ask, especially when it comes to money. We've all been there. We've all made 
mistakes with money. We've we've all had issues with debt on some some level or another. We've all been there, and we can share in that experience together and help each other out. And we, for one, as a nonprofit agency, we're here to help you, not to judge you. We're willing to walk alongside you and and help you achieve that financial stability for you and your family and achieve a better a better quality of life. And we know that quality of life looks different. Uh, for everyone. So that's number seven, um, investing wisely. And then we'll touch on number eight, uh, monitoring your plan. And then we'll we'll pause to see if there's any questions or, or comments because I'd love to be able to hear from you as, as well as, as I said, I just don't want to regurgitate this information. I want to hear from you and learn from you as well. So number eight is, is monitoring your plan. You've went through all the hard work, <coughs> excuse me, of developing this plan and a strategy. You've done that introspection. You've done all the hard work, hard behind the scenes work. And now you want to monitor your plan. You want to evaluate, is your plan working? You want to have the freedom to be able to adjust your plan saying, you know what? Maybe that's not, maybe I'm, I'm trying to put too much money away and I should apply more money um, uh, to my debt. Or, or to um, something you're, you're, you're saving for. Um, we often talk about needs versus wants. It's okay to have wants, but if you have a spending plan, you'll be able to buy that with cash and not put that particular want on a credit card and amass that interest and, and what have you. So there's needs and wants, adjusting your plan accordingly and execute. No matter if you have some struggles along the way and challenges, execute. Put the plan in motion, and then you can always go back and reevaluate and adjust. And although it's not here as a bullet point, I mentioned earlier, celebrate your, your success. Whether that means going to Dairy Queen and buying a peanut buster parfait, uh, taking your spouse or loved one out um, for a meal, uh, celebrate those successes because if you don't, your plan can become stagnant. You won't see the merit in it. So it's important to celebrate those successes. And I will um, stop for a moment as Rachel and Emily, if they look, if there's anything in the chat room, I don't see anything from my end, but uh, we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to make a comment or a, a suggestion. I think we have a client group tonight. They're letting, they're letting me off easy today, aren't they? For sure. And that's okay. We'll go ahead and advance uh, to the next slide. And this is one of my favorite uh, topics uh, to present on and also to learn from others. And these are the top 10 budget killers. And we just have a little aside there. It says freeing up these funds can help pay down debt and boost savings. And a lot of times when we're working with individuals on their budget, and we do a very exhaustive budget uh, with them. We try to give them the tools that they need ahead of time so they can think about uh, how they're spending their money. But they have a nice uh, budget in their hand or in their inbox uh, on their email to be able to look at that when we're done. But there are some budget monsters that you may not even realize where money is going. And maybe you haven't even thought about it. When you do the math, you say, wow, it's one of those aha moments when the light bulb goes on. But uh, these are probably 10 of, of the most popular. And by all means, if you have others, please enter those into the chat because I will learn from that and I'll be able to share those with our counselors who are counseling individuals. And you know that, that information be, can go viral in our agency and help out other people. But online shopping, and my mom recently passed away. And I have to tell you that, um, she was addicted to the home shopping network and i found myself and she was on one of those reoccurring plans like with makeup and she wouldn't have to place an order each month she would click on the reoccurring and she, which meant that she kept getting the packages every month i don't know how she could have used all this makeup and even when she was uh, close to the throes of death i said mom do you want me to send this back or do you want to keep it she said no 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 keep it so um we did end up sending all that back and it credited her account and what have you, but you have to be very careful. 
and online shopping and clicking on those reoccurring uh, payments. And you have to read the fine print because you may find uh, yourself, um, your debit card, um, seeing money come out of that each month through your credit card. And you may not even know that. So be very careful uh, with online shopping and evaluate if you're able to get something a little cheaper by going to Kohl's and using Kohl's cash or going to a thrift store. Grocery shopping by far can eat up a lot of your, your dollars that you've allocated um, for groceries. And why I say that is we often go to the grocery store when we're hungry. And if you do not go with the shopping list, I would highly encourage you to go with the shopping list, stick to your list, and make sure that you go when you're not hungry because what you will find is um, you're, you're going to start to salivate when you see those Oreos and when you see uh, those loaded Ritz crackers and you see things that aren't on your list, you're just going to naturally start putting them in your grocery cart. So stick to a list. Um, don't go grocery shopping uh, with your, when you're hungry. If you can shop without your children, um, that is a great thing to do. I took my daughter shopping. This weekend, we only were going in for milk and eggs. And before I knew it, they were putting into my cart this uh, cold brew coffee and these specialty cookies. And well, I saw uh, what would have been maybe five to eight dollars I was going to spend a mass into 20 or 30 dollars. So look at your grocery list, check it twice. Don't go to grocery shopping when you're hungry. Subscription services. Be very careful with those um, because a lot of times we subscribe to things and we don't take, we don't utilize those services with the full intention we originally had. And we say, ah, oh, well, I subscribe to this online magazine or online newspaper and I'm not even using it. And you forget about it, but yet you're still paying for it. And that can easily, whether it's nine or ten dollars an hour, um, a month. My wife and I subscribe to Netflix. We don't have cable television. It's $19.63 a month. Um, but if I didn't use it, I would probably forget about the fact that Netflix is extracting that money from my checking account each month. So watch out for those things. Technology projects, products are often really costly. Examine it. Would that be good debt for you? Would that be, is there a return on investment? Is it benefiting you and your family, such as a, a, a tax product that you can do your own taxes yourself and it's going to save you and your family money from paying an accountant to do it, so to speak? I will, I will add in the point that sometimes using a CPA or a professional accountant, depending on uh, your taxes and, and, and what you're paying out, and if you uh, own your own business, what have you sometimes using them is is best but if it's just a single an easy type of return um, i'd encourage you to look at some of those those uh, uh tax techno technology projects buying lunch every day wow to go out and spend five dollars a day if you're able to stick to five dollars i think most lunches will add into uh eight to ten dollars a day can you maybe curb back on that a little bit and maybe not buy lunch five days a week but say okay I'm only going to buy lunch two days a week and I'm going to brown bag it the other three days. That will free up money in your budget. And as much as I like eating out, and that's probably, um, probably one of my biggest budget killers and one that I'm always working on. I always tell people if there was an Olympic medal for eating, I'd probably have a gold medal. But um, finding different ways to work through that and brown bagging it. A household essentials. I'm looking at your cleaning products and what you're spending uh, your money on. Can you buy one product that's like three in one? It will do uh, clean your glass. It'll be a general disinfectant. And who knows, maybe it's also good on wood products. If you're only buying one product, that's taking the place of three. Um, even something simple as using household dryer sheets. Did you know that you can get sometimes more than one use out of a household dryer sheet? And if you have a Keurig machine, um, if you, you can use that little K-cup more than once, if you tap it, um, it'll bring the, the coffee grounds up to the top. There's different ways to save money, which leads us into number seven, which is coffee. Food delivery, although it's very convenient, 
And sometimes I'm in my shorts and pajamas and rather pick up the phone and call Grubhub or Eat Street. My son happens to work for Eat Street. It would be so convenient. Um, you know, you're going to have to pay a tip and those things add up. And not to say you shouldn't use those things, but um, it wouldn't be something that maybe you should consider doing twice a week. Maybe do it on Fridays. It's Pizza Friday. So it's important to celebrate. It's important to, to take a break from cooking and dishes, but you want to do that strategically. Number nine, we may want to move up number nine gym memberships to the number one spot. I'm just doing a time check, excuse me. Um, you may want to consider gym memberships. And even though it may be only $15 a month, are you using that faithfully or is that $15 a month going out the window? Can you exercise at home? And there's something said about calisthenics, sit-ups, push-ups. You don't need any exercise machines for those. Or maybe you can invest in an exercise machine that you can get online at Facebook Marketplace. Or uh, you can go to a garage sale. And pe people often sell those very inexpensively because they're taking up much-needed space in their house. And, of course, entertainment. Going to the movies is very expensive. Maybe you can subscribe to Netflix. Or maybe you can take advantage of these $5 movie nights, like at Marcus Theaters, where it's $5 a person, and they even throw in popcorn as well. So if I could use the old cliche, the old adage, you could have your cake and eat it too. Well, are there any other questions or comments, or maybe you'd like to add to our top 10 budget killers, and maybe we'll make it our top 15 budget killers. We do have a comment and a question for you. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And the question is, do you have any additional pros or cons for consolidating loans? I think some of the ones we talked about, and if this is specifically to uh, the car loans and things of that nature, you could also talk about um, medical debt as well. Um, I would encourage you to, to uh, make an appointment um, with our agency, we'd love to to do a deep dive with you and dig a little deeper. But some of the points that we made earlier about building that relationship with your local banker, um, talking about uh, debt co consolidation, loan consolidation, maybe a cash out refinance. If you've built equity in your home, you know you could borrow against that. Um, if I would share this this one point with you, I would highly recommend never dipping into your retirement savings and, and borrowing against that. If you've done that, I'm not pointing a finger at you, but if you've never done that and are considering, um, I would highly caution you to do that because um, then you're going to have to pay that back. There could be penalties, and that's money that you're saving uh, for retirement and your, your golden year, years. And I know myself of working in nonprofit and not making a lot financially and seeing the benefit on the other side and saying that you can't put a price tag on helping people, what have you, that I'm working harder now to, to build that up, so to speak, because I did, did dip into that um, as a newlywed to help pay off some of my wife's uh, school loan debt. Um, if you have student loans, we can help you with that too, to um, work with your, your loan provider and look at some loan forgiveness in that respect, um, or to look at a different type of plan uh, to potentially decrease your monthly payment to free up money that you can then apply uh, to debt. We can also talk about the snowball or the avalanche method. Once you pay off a credit card, the money you would then be allotting to each month, you could then use that and then pay down your next credit card. And we always highly recommend pay down the credit card that you have the highest balance on first, pay that off, take some of that money you would have been applying to that, then pay down the next one and so forth and so forth because it's been very overwhelming um, trying to do that to multiple cards at once. And we'd be happy to share that information with you. But building a rapport with your local banker is key as well. Um, the next screen talks about a debt management plan. We do have debt management plans, and I do want to share at the forefront. The debt management plan is a way for you to consolidate your debt. Um, you would pay our, our agency a monthly fee. We would work out a payment plan with your creditors. And if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, um, 
a starting balance of $15,000 with an interest rate of 18%. And if you really look at some of the, the averages, that could be 24.5%. We're using 18% as a point of discussion and a minimum monthly payment of $375. The number of months to pay off that debt would be 382 months. And the interest you would have paid on that $15,000 starting balance is going to be $21,000. A debt management plan and 100% of what you would pay to us would go directly uh, to your creditors. We do not charge. Uh, uh, it would be an upfront fee to get you set up on the debt management plan of, of $25. After that, 100% goes into paying that debt. And then we would receive uh, money back from the creditors, what they call fair share. And that pays us a small percentage of these plans. And that way, the um, credit card company doesn't have to open up their own debt management department. They pay um, third party individuals such as us. But 100% of what you pass goes to pay that, pay that off. And you can see the difference the starting balance of $15,000, your interest rate is reduced to 8%. Um, your monthly payments have been reduced by $70 to $305. And now it's taking 60 months to pay that off. So in three to five years, you can have that paid off with a total interest savings of $18,686. And, and look at the total time savings. It's amazing, almost 27 years. So that's another... Uh, avenue and the debt management plan works for some. It works uh, for does work for some. And it doesn't work for others. But we can work with you um, through a counseling session to give you an idea of that. So you have something in your hand. Say, wow, this will work for me and my family. Or, or no, we're going to use some more traditional methods to do that. We could move on to the uh, the next slide. But please, if you have any questions. I um, wanted to end with some uh, financial uh, resources for you, and then we'll turn it back over uh, to Rachel. And once again, this has been the 100-foot view. And if you really want to dissect this further, I encourage you to reach out to your local financial institution and to us as well. We would love to be able to, to work with you and, and discuss um, things that you and your family have been talking about as far as reducing debt or maybe creating that savings plan and and uh, we work with a, a bunch of different financial institutions and we have to point you in the right direction. But um, your bank has uh, different resources such as Bank First, as I said, to be able to help you build that relationship, uh, build, build that rapport uh, with them. They have loan consolidation, student loan refinance opportunities, um, auto and personal loans, um, mortgage loans with low and no down payment options. Uh, checking accounts, savings accounts, and solutions for small businesses. And I love the point in blue on the bottom that your community banker is ready to help help you to reach your financial goals. And and uh, I work with many banks, and I can I can um, be a, a poster child for any of them. Um, but I, I'm very grateful to Bank First for providing us with this opportunity, and they've been very amiable and very very friendly and easy to work with and I truly feel uh, that they have the best interests of their clients at heart and uh, I'm very appreciative of that. So uh, with that said, once again, uh, our contact information will appear on the next slide. And we are licensed in Wisconsin and Minnesota and you can call our office at any time and schedule an appointment and some we will be able to schedule you uh, on the same day or if you want a late evening appointment our counselors do rotate we have a counselor here right now doing late night appointments to be able to meet the needs of you and your family and we want to be very sensitive to that but any of our counselors are available and will give you the same level of service so we're licensed in the whole of wisconsin and minnesota fully accredited nonprofit, and we're here to help you and and uh, we like to say that we're options people we want to be able to present options that work best for you and your family so thank you so much the gift of time today and i will turn it back over to rachel and emily for the wrap-up thank you if there's any other questions feel free to enter those into the box right now um, but thank you so much for joining us and thank you daryl you will all receive an email with a link to this webinar as well as a link to complete a short survey so we greatly appreciate your feedback and encourage you to uh, complete the survey. You'll be entered to win a $100 Visa gift card once it's completed. Um, thank you so much and have a good night.